So my understanding of, of jhana comes through a few different sources. Um, the primary, of course, being my own experience. And like if a teaching doesn't square with my own experience, uh, I question the teaching, not my experience. So it's like my study of jhana post October sit was or service was uh, primarily through a book by Shyla Catherine. Uh, she's a meditation teacher on the West Coast. Have you heard of her? Mm -mm. Okay, her books are Focused and Fearless: A Practical Guide to Mastering the Jhanas. And Wisdom Wide and Deep, um, which is more comprehensive. She basically translates a, uh, an 8th century Theravadan text called the Vishuddhi Magga, which is like a meditation guide, essentially. It's like a compilation, uh, a, co a compendium of techniques developed up to that point by the monastic traditions in the Tever Theravada lineages. Um, in a nutshell, what I speculate physiologically is happening in jhana. Did you watch the Lee Brasington talk, by the way, where he's in the classroom with the chalkboard? and? No, I just got started on that one. Okay. He gets close, uh, but his, his historical framing is really good around like how the jhanas are described in the earliest Buddhist suttas. Like, the one I was talking about, the Anapana Sutta, the jhanas are described in there. And what we know about the practice is that it was like the core practice that the Buddha taught and, and practiced himself was, was jhana, which I think at the time was basically synonymous with meditation. It would be the word that they would use for meditation that we call meditation nowadays. Although nowadays meditation covers a wide range of techniques, but jhana at the time was very specifically this kind of uh, absorptive technique. Absorption meditation is another way that it's usually translated. And I think of it as, so jhana and vipassana are kind of complementary, but opposite directions. They're, they're opposite poles for uh, directions for attention to go. Um, As you step up through the jhanas, you're, um, you're essentially standing on where the uh, brain is contacting bodily sensation and, and, and ratcheting and standing up a little bit higher. I think of it sort of going up through the jhanas is sort of like a baby going from, from crawling to wobbling to standing to like jumping to flying you know it's it's sort of like that and you have to kind of like build each stage upon the next what and this is literally from like yesterday up until yesterday the speculation in me what's happening is what's the one thing that's like always that always has to be okay for the brain to be in touch with in the muscular system. Like the brain can't live without oxygen, right? It's the one thing it has to control in order to, to get what it needs. The heart will actually beat on its own without the brain's intervention. This is why CPR works. The, the heart has its own like sparking mechanism, right? The lungs will not inflate on their own. <laughs> they have to be inflated by the expansion uh, or rather by the contraction and downward pulling of the diaphragm, which for most of us is an automatic action. Our brains are just breathing mindlessly pretty much all the time. Um, if you think about it, at some point we had to learn how to breathe. For nine months in the womb, we were not using the diaphragm. 
to live, right? And then we came out of the amniotic fluid and whoosh, air. It's probably like the first trauma that the human body experiences is crap. <laughs> I have to use this thing I've got inside here to to live. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's, so that's like the first thing the brain has to be okay with doing is contracting the diaphragm and it pretty much always has to be okay with doing that in order to survive as we grow up though like painful experiences accumulate around the act of breathing that that most basic of okayness i mean it begins as as soon as the doctor like slaps us on the back or whatever you know to like get us to breathe you know, it's like oh man i feel pain in my back and those contract and then i breathe or like i'm crawling and i bump into something and i you know my nervous system shrinks away from whatever that was and the breath stops. And so every time I have some conscious part or maybe slightly subconscious has to override that impulse to not breathe, right? Has to override some other part of the nervous system telling me that it's not okay to breathe. And over time, this accumulation just gets so big that so much of the body is tacitly, if not explicitly, experiencing stress and pain through the mere act of breathing in various positions. And consciousness shrinks into a smaller and smaller and smaller area that it can safely occupy without bumping up into this ambient map of, of the minefield of stress and pain that will occur if I am feeling something while breathing. Until dissociation, numbness, and depression become the operative mode of human existence so <laughs> the deep insight that the buddha had and probably he wasn't the first one but he sure as hell put this front and center was if that's the root start there start with the one thing that is always okay to do no matter what, and work outward. And so this is why I believe we begin with the attention narrows down exclusively to the breath. In, in the first jhana, this is the instruction, is narrow the attention down to just the act of breathing in and out in the present moment. Forget thoughts, forget sensations, forget anything. Close all of the sense doors down. Focus the entirety of all of your neuronal firings on the sense of safety in the present moment with breathing. It's really hard <laughs> at first. <laughs> but it gets easier and easier and easier because what fires together wires together and as the brain focuses on the breath it gets the idea oh wait the stuff closely associated with breathing is actually okay i was wrong right it begins to learn the truth from the inside out and it expands because every with every breath a little bit more is touched, right? And I think of attention kind of, it tries to stay really, really close around the breath, but it's gonna wander a little bit, right? It's gonna bump into other sensations or thoughts. 
but because most of the attention is on the safety and okayness of the breath, that's all right. And those things get kind of like, well, for lack of a better term, they get flipped. I think of them sort of as bits that said, not okay, not okay, not okay, not okay, pain. And the breath just goes, no, actually you're okay. And just every time it expands a little bit, they get like absorbed a little bit by this expanding sense of okayness in the present moment. So in, in jhana, this is one of like a few of the qualities that are considered the five factors of jhana. We've talked about um, three of them so far, directed focus, um, directed attention and sustained attention. So direct the attention to the breath and stay with the breath. When the attention wanders off, come back. When the attention wanders off, come back. The third would be anchoredness, this sense of I'm only paying attention to the breath right now, not anything else. And the breath is home. That's how I, I would put this factor. It's like my home becomes breathing in the present moment, and not thinking about this or that or feeling or following or whatever. My home is breathing now and feeling safe. The other two factors are extremely important and I cannot understate how important they are. And I've not to this point in my research heard of anyone who stresses this in beginning meditation. The other two factors are called rapture or pity and uh, happiness or contentedness, sukkha. They map directly to the endogenous generation of dopamine and endorphin in the body. Directly. You've probably felt them when you've orgasmed. <laughs> yeah. Right. You probably felt them being with horses. <laughs> Yeah, a shivering, totally no. showering rapture that just floods mm -hmm. through the entire body, followed usually right afterward by a sense of warmth, like honey, warm honey flowing through the veins that calms everything in its wake. Usually those experiences for me were a gift from God. <laughs> <laughs> grace right mm -hmm. uh, or the or love right like the experience of love for me was associated with those sensations at a very deep level and so the the flip for me in the practice was when i through my own self-talk during the meditation practice began to just love myself <laughs> And um, the first few times it happened were, were monumental, right? were, were truly miraculous, like the sense of, of, you know, connection with heaven or the divine or something like that, transcendental, because it was a full body pleasure and, and feeling of safety and belonging in, uh, in the world and in that moment. But it faded because it was so overwhelming, like this was so new and so unprecedented for me to feel uh, on my own, merely through the act of loving myself. However, once I had the frame that, wait, these are factors of, of the practice. These are not special. These are actually foundational. <laughs> there was a bit of a, a moment of like, wait, what? what? But that's, can't that be the end? Isn't that what everybody is going for? No. <laughs> That's where you begin. <laughs> because the first jhana is the sustained feeling of pity, of rapture, of dopamine release, while in contact with whatever is at the edge of the breath awareness. 
And so as breath awareness begins to expand from, from here out into you know, the face, the head, the body parts, it begins to encounter pain <laughs> or discomfort, right? And the factors begin to lose their stability. I sort of think of them in some ways as like different instruments playing. And, you know, they've all got, they've all got their track to play. But then like a monster comes crashing into the concert hall and the violinist is like, ah! <laughs> like kind of messes up and the conductor has to be like, no, <laughs> it's an illusion. Bring, come back to the, you know, we're here on the page. Play, <laughs> keep playing. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, the, the tuba of Sukha, you know, drops the instrument, you know, and, and the, you know, it reverberates. And so you just have to keep all of them on track, no matter what sensation is present. What's really cool, though, is uh, dopamine has the physiological effect of countering pain directly. It actually, and dopamine and, and endorphins together uh, relax the musculature. Um, which is the origin of pain, uh, mostly for most people. We have a lot of uh, what are called nociceptors or pain receptors in the body, and some of them are associated with feeling like sensations of hot or cold. Uh, many of them are sensing pressure. Uh, many of them are in the skin. Many of them are in the muscles. Some of them are in parts of the ears, the eyes, the, the different internal organs, etc. There's lots of some of them sense um, uh, chemical changes like, you know, or thirsty or hungry. Uh, those are certain kinds of receptors. And they can all send pain to, to the brain, to the, to the um, wherever, probably the somatosensory cortex, I forget what it's called, but to the brain, um, if they need to get the brain's attention for some reason, right? Pain is a signal that attention needs to go there. And usually, when attention goes to the pain, it notices that there's something wrong and does the appropriate counteraction, whether it's moving the body in a particular way, away from the pain, or putting food or water into the body. Some action is needed. But if attention doesn't go to the pain, eventually the pain signal just kind of gives up. It just, it just sort of gets like the brain pushes it away enough times that it's just like, never mind. But the brain is actually like building a barrier between that signal and whatever the receptor in the brain is. And so it shuts, it just shuts off the, ch it's like hanging up the phone basically. But when dopamine and, and sukha begin to, when dopamine and, and uh, our endogenous morphine, opiates, begin to pick up all the phones that have been put down <laughs> throughout the body, the other end is still going to be screaming. <laughs> but it's screaming from the past. It's not actually a present moment sensation anymore. It's like the message gets stuck in voicemail, basically. Like the other the pain just leaves a voicemail. <laughs> and so when the voicemail gets read, you know this, you'll listen to a voicemail, maybe from someone who's passed away or from, you know, a long time ago. And it's just like they're there in the present moment, right? All the associations and all the feelings that come along with hearing that person's voice all come back. It can be really compelling. You can think that the person is there in the room with you or that you could just call them back but they're not and you you can't but what you can do is listen to the voicemail you can let it out of the buffer and it's a lot easier to let it out of the buffer if you're loving yourself through that process and so mm -hmm. the dopamine and the and the um, and the endorphin the pity and the sukkah soothe the mind as it releases these things that have been trapped for so long in parts of the mind body connection and the more that you do that the more channels you open back up the more uh, nerve endings come back online with a sense of safety the more of the body you can continue to feel 
with a sense of safety. And so that, that uh, envelope of safety around the breath just continues to expand. And it's kind of a positive feedback loop. Um, the analogy I often use is like, well, here, here it is. If you're emptying the voicemail box, it means you have more slots available to, to take in new messages or, or, um, or like another way that I've put it is sometimes this process feels like um, going deep into the ocean and meeting all the monsters that are there. <laughs> and I'll start with like the crabs and the sharks on the shore, you know, slightly offshore. Yeah, but eventually working your way down into the, you know, the giant squids and, you know, oh shit, you know, you've got only so much of a light, but um, each time you, I meet a new creature, there's that moment of like, ah, are you going to kill me? You're not killing me. <gasps> well, I can keep breathing, huh? Hey, do you want to go look for more creatures? And usually it's like, yeah, I'll be your friend. <laughs> like, I just needed to say that thing. I don't even know why I was stuck for so long, but what's actually here now? And then we go exploring together. Uh, but then eventually you like run into Godzilla. <laughs> and Godzilla looks really scary at first, you know, you can breathe fire and he's giant and everything. And then you're like, wait, Godzilla, you're just a guy in a lizard suit kicking down cardboard, aren't you? And Godzilla's like, it's <laughs> like, hey, do you want to like help me meet all your friends down there? And he's like, rawr, rawr. and then we just kind of like go down together. And so each part of the body that's felt with the sense of safety becomes an ally, <laughs> feeling more dogs. <laughs> Godzilla, he's going after him. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's that's basically that's basically the the story. Um, and so, the higher jhanas uh, or the the deeper jhanas are refinements of those states of rapture and and contentedness, eventually leading to. Um, so the first jhana is all pity, is all rapture, is all dopamine. Um, the second jhana is a mixture of pity and dopamine. Or I just love mixing up the terms. It's a mixture of pity and sukha. Um, that the velocity is is the soothing. So it's like go out, sense everything with literally the same sensation as orgasm. By the way, <laughs> like so, meditation just becomes like an hour long orgasm. <laughs> I I don't want to understate that. Like <laughs> it's pretty great. Um, <laughs> I'm blushing now. That's funny. Um, but then uh, uh, it the then eventually it's like okay, all right, we've we've done enough of this. Let's let's come down now, and the sukha begins to take over, and that's like more third jhana is is like okay, I'm sending just just morphine. Like I'm I've never taken heroin, but I imagine it feels somewhat like endogenous morphine or opiates. And the whole body just like relaxes down. You get real, real calm. And then the fourth jhana is equanimity. It's basically sukha subsides. The pumping of, of, of opiates into the body turns off. And there's pretty much no sensation. I mean, like a heroin addict is just like so numbed out, right, to everything. And they're just experiencing pure bliss, right? It goes beyond bliss into just like you're just like there <laughs> that's it um from there so again jhana jhana and vipassana complement each other right so then you come out of jhana and meet sensation in in the world um and so the technique for me was like meeting more and 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 more like that sense of home just expanding out and out and out and uh, at some point i bumped up into crap if i feel more of my body there's a lot of 
pain when I push through that barrier of like, I've got to, I've got to open the voicemail box. I would open a voicemail box and there would just be thousands of, of pain messages in my legs from the soccer, right? Or my throat from the Taekwondo when we did choke holds or from, you know, the feet because my feet were in soccer cleats for eight years, just crunched into this tiny little area, right? Immobilized, uh, unable to get blood flow, unable to feel safe. Um, and so I was like, I think, I think physiologically I need to do some, do some work. And so I brought a, I brought a foam roller and the notion of, of trauma release exercise to the sit in December and combining the two with jhana practice became the practice. So I would sit, I would absorb, I would soothe the entire body with a sense of rapture and bliss. And then I would go back into my room and just like, torture myself basically <laughs> and i mean it was unskillful i guess because i didn't have any guidance i was totally offline right um hadn't learned from anybody but i think in doing so i i really pushed myself to the extent that i needed to i wasn't i i, I like really noticed afterward i was like i'm not injuring myself after each one of these sessions like it hurts a lot in the moment and there's a lot of shaking and there's a lot of like sweating and everything. And, and sometimes I'll get like sucked into the, like what feels like a deep dark hole that's trying to suck me somewhere, like scare me or whatever. But then I'm like, every time I'm like, it's like facing Godzilla. I'm like, are you going to kill me? I can still breathe. Okay. I'm fine. You know? And just like kept going. And um, I think because I, I pushed so hard, um, it all moved really, really quickly. I would come out of it and like my limbs were working again. Like my toes could move and my like calves, I could feel sensation on parts of my calves that I had, that I didn't, like it was new. It was like parts of my back were, were like, as my lumbar muscles were, were, um, you know, there would be like a spasm that would burn all the way up the back and like come across the shoulders and take like 15 minutes, you know, and my, I think I burned out like my chemical ability to produce dopamine after doing this for like eight hours a day, you know, in, in some cases. So, um, it was really just pain. Um, but I just pushed through it. And, and after every single one of those burns, more of the body would, would be open to sensation. And then when I would come back to Jhana, it, it was, it was mm. astounding, like mm. how refined the subtlety of sensation that awareness could touch became mm. and how uh, easy it was to go for it you know, the whole sit without a thought, right? Wow, I get it. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's like I, the, I would just swing the pendulum back and forth, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger each way and, um, and just make space. Again, just making space around the sense of, of breath. But I got to say, it's a hell of a lot more than any of these practices on their own. There was the, 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 um, the refinement of the ability to direct attention meant that I could like, if tremoring began in a particular part of the body, that was usually an indication that, that there was, it was like shaking around some kind of spasm, spasm body, some knot, right? And if I, if I directed my attention or even like brought a finger over and like just put it on that part of the body, attention could like focus, it could like lock on to just the thing that actually needed attention in the moment. And like once attention was locked on, I would sort of like turn on pity and sukha. I would like turn on the rapture and the, and the opiate, turn on the dopamine and the opiates and like, you know, like, and it would literally, I was feeling these like knots just, just melting away in the body, like, like a person doing deep tissue massage or rolfing, right. Or, or mm -hmm. any kind of energy work. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was all like directed attention from within my own body. 
And so I just kept working. I worked from the spine outward. I worked from the breath outward. I worked on like the throat, the heart, the lower back, the, you know, the spinal column and just all the little, the little knots between my vertebrae. I had so much popping, you know, like my back would pop and be in a different position every single sit. Like I would, I would, you know, do something with my neck and I'd be like, my neck can do that. <laughs> you know, there were so many of these moments where I was like, and by the end of, this 10 days I could sit full lotus for an hour I was like the first time I did it I was like cool <laughs> and, then, and then that became normal you know it's like each one of these ratchets was like okay now that becomes the new baseline you know that that to me is um one way of putting the buddhist notion of uh of unsatisfactoriness it's one of the three characteristics of like everything um everything is like uh inconstant unsatisfactory and not self right so i am not this pain that is coming at me uh it's changing it's look at it it just keeps changing and is it making you happy in the long term is it no <laughs> like just can't like those three things just keep cycling with every even including the attainments right including the including the, the refinements of the skill of of concentration and and uh and the application of it right um so tree i or tre i see as like it's an easy bridge for people if they haven't developed like the ability to to concentrate that well right like i mean it takes hours like we're talking like probably three or four hundred hours of of dedicated practice before i got up to the, the point where i could that, that was before going into the um the sit in december and then the sit in december was like an hour a hundred hours or so on its own uh but then in the intervening three months you know there's a little bit of a dip when you meet the variety of of sensation and body experience outside of a retreat context um it changes a little bit and what I had noticed, by the way, at the end of the retreat is I was not experiencing a single ounce of chronic pain anywhere in my entire body, no matter what I did, including holding four suitcases for a person. Like, no muscle fatigue for like 20 minutes. Like, I, like just with these spindly little arms, right? the body was, its pain threshold was like so high, right? Like I had reduced the ambient level of stress and tension in the body from, from being like right here all the time to like way down here. And like, it just absolutely changed the way I was perceiving like uh, anything optical, auditory, like all the, all, so much more of the brain was like available for experiencing the mm -hmm. world with curiosity and openness mm -hmm. right <laughs> so and of course you know that that changes when you you know you go through traffic and you come back and see friends and like all the things that are that are associated with pain <laughs> start coming back into awareness you have to continue doing the practice in contact with all of those sensations and then three months and now since then uh, I'm beginning to come back into just in my day-to-day -day life. I'm beginning to to recome, recover that level of like this. This is the pain threshold. This is the actual like um, level of of ambient stress and tension. Um, and so the work continues, you know. But if I had to bottom line it, because you asked for that, I know I've gone mm -hmm. on at length about this, but it was been <clears> helpful <throat> for me. If I had to bottom line it, the practices are our jhana meditation um vipassana practice i don't know if i want to call it meditation exactly and um allowing the body to shake if it needs to i don't even want to call it tre it's just allowing this natural tremor mechanism which at some point this was trippy to me is like 
the, I think it was when I realized that, that the, the focusing was possible, that the like shaking around the thing could be focused. And then it just like dramatically sped up the release. So what I, what I would do is like in a particular muscle group, I would, I would like press in to a knot until there was like a spike of pain. And then I would release and I would keep, I would keep a, a very light focus, like pressure, um, very, very light pressure there, or I would just direct, direct sensation if it was, if it was possible to do so from within, I would, I would direct attention from within and just follow the movement of the release. And I figure because the tension balls are all like close to each other in the, in the ner- neural structure or something that the random firings around that, that spike were able to like track the actual like trauma or or whatever you want to call it like all of the red stuff (laughs) and flip them all to blue automatically as attention stayed with them they all flipped automatically as the random firings were just sort of around that they would all flip and they would flip faster or slower depending on how tight my attention was able to stay on that particular thing so if i thought about something else or if i if i split attention between two of these the the overall speed would decrease right because the brain was kind of having to like Mm -hmm. switch back and forth between the two of them right um i equate it to like on a computer when you're trying to copy uh and paste two files like move two files simultaneously and the hard drive is like jumping back and forth between two (laughs) parts of the of the memory it's actually probably the exact same thing um and and so that mechanism became automatic uh, the, the, the TRE thing, like it went from the, the like random weird, like full body shaking thing to this like refined stream of release that happened very, 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 very quickly in a particular muscle group because there was, there was no tension anywhere else in the body to pull attention away from that releasing mm-hmm. beam. Yeah. Right. So that whatever you want to call it i don't know if that's an energy healing technique or some mm-hmm. shit that i just rediscovered mm-hmm. probably um mm-hmm. plus what's called jhana meditation and vipassana practice uh, along mm-hmm. with you know eating well and uh getting enough mm-hmm. rest and most importantly doing this consistently for at least three hour long sessions a day and as as much holding as much mindfulness as possible in the intervening time, right? So you, it's, it can't just be, I'm on the cushion, I'm off the cushion. I realize like there is no distinction. And then the Buddha actually talks about this is the, the meditator should just be continually mindful. And he literally means this. It's like you never actually stop meditating. <laughs> Right. Um, Ever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll uh, I'll end there. That's that's a lot. You seem affected. Um, I'm yeah, I mean, what it, the, the impact is. Um. So you just did a beautiful job, just like you did <laughs> that interview of of you know just putting it together in this logical um, stream. And it affirms my my knowing that, so what, what I do in my practice is something along these lines without as much body. Oh. Body awareness. So it's a lot about you know, turning towards the monsters. Yes. With a warm heart, you know, curiosity and openness. And when we, when we turn, which is really translated as love. Yep. Turn towards them, you know, like, wow, what's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> what are Rather, you actually? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, ah, no. Uh-huh. No. Which, which is what people normally want to do sitting in the chair, you know, with me. And we said, I asked a question, you know, well, what about that? And then, you know, 
the body says, I'm not safe. You know, I can't breathe. Ah! And uh, yeah. But we do, so we're doing this process, but we're doing it. It's just still too much from here. And, um, yeah, that's just what it is. Here's my thing. This can make infinite stories. <laughs> infinite. Literally infinite. This only has so much, right? <laughs> <laughs> I make up stories. Yeah. It, it is truth in every moment. Yeah. Like that's for it. Um, <laughs> so when we can we can quiet this down and really tune into this, then we are we're on our way. Yeah. And if if this, this is weighed down by this, because this is prior, right? The food, uh-huh. the breath, the blood, all of that has to be working well, right? And so the, nice. the brain's contact with the body, it, it, there's a, the, what is it? The amygdala is like the smoke That's detector, right? right? Mm-hmm. And so in, the, in that other talk I talked about, the amygdala sensing this, this ambient stress and tension and then tripping off an alarm. That's like mm-hmm. people going, ah, I can't breathe or whatever. Right. That's an That's automatic right. thing. And you've probably right. seen that as trigger, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So it has to, yeah, like, but the body... Mm-hmm. Once it's not, once it's actually taken care of and loved and listened to. That's right. Respected. Thoroughly respected. Totally respected. Is actually a major ally. And, and mm-hmm. this, is, this is where the, coming back to the suttas again is I've, uh, in the Lee Brasington talk, um, he, he mentions the line explicitly, but it goes something like this, where after you go through the process of jhana, after you step through the jhanas, the body has become a foundation. And so then the mind is able to stand on the entirety of the body fully safe, right? The mind has gone like all the way out into the body and been like, we're cool, right? We've scanned, we've swept all the corners. We've inspected the entire place. There are no monsters to come at us right now. And then you go up into examination of thought. You then go, you begin to go through the, the examination of the arising and passing away of mental phenomena. And that's not something that I've really explored much at this point because I'm still working on getting the foundation good. If you don't do this, your work in the thought realm is always going to be constricted. Like, I cannot emphasize this enough is so many people think that they're awakened or whatever. And like, mm-hmm. I thought it for a long time too. It's like, I have these momentary experiences because I'm just in my head, right? Mm-hmm. But then right. as soon as you begin to dip your toe in just a little bit to the body, it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> it's like, or, or, it'll, or it'll suck away the energy really, really quickly. Mm-hmm. And the states will just, will just dissolve. That's because the body is still not taken care of fully. And like, I, I cannot emphasize enough that doing the work here makes this work so much better and easier. <laughs> like it's, it's crazy the amount of like thought and insight I've, I've been able to access just in, in the couple of months since then. Like the level of creativity and generativity, is, it's like I'm a kid again. It literally, it feels the same way. So, yeah. yeah. And that's really, you know, my awareness of that, that my creativity and my ability to move into my life in a bigger way is directly related to what's happening in my body. Directly. Like, directly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't quite know how to quantify the, the, the magnitude of this, but. Um, qualitatively it is it is miraculous and on a whole new level um, for me and uh, I wonder if just I haven't I didn't have an appreciation for the extent to which I was um, exhibiting symptoms of post-traumatic stress or just you know embodied trauma in some way Um, but it I mean I'm a different person I'm fuller you know more whole more me which makes the practice of letting go of that self 
a hell of a lot easier. Mm-hmm. You, can't lo- you can't let go of something you don't know fully. This is like the message of the Buddha is you do fabrication, you do Vipassana, you look at the entirety of the world and everything that is, that is possible as a way of, de- you, you do the fabrication in order to deconstruct it, right? So you look at the entirety of the truth as you can experience it within yourself. That's your karma, right? Your pattern, your body, your genes, your history, whatever. That's what you, that is your gateway, Right? That is your path to awakening. And you do not get to awaken without going through that. And it will Mm -hmm. be a rock dragging behind you if you don't like turn around and love it and like let it transform into the, into the, the, you know, whatever the eagles from Lord of the Rings are, you know, (laughs) it's actually one of their eggs right you know you actually turn around incubate it a little bit and it hatches and then you can fucking fly like that thing that you've been dragging is your ticket (laughs) so sit on it shut up and sit on it (laughs) that's it it. 